what was the first high school in America? The standard answer that historians will give you is Boston's English Classical School, which opened in 1821 with 102 students. But that answer is misleading because it took many decades to figure out what the definition of a high school in America was. In Boston, for instance, there was already a quasi-public school that taught advanced subjects like Latin. And it was called the Latin Grammar School, and it dated back to the 1600s. Both names sound awfully elitist to our ears. English classical, Latin grammar, both were all male. Still, the schools were different. The Latin Grammar School was oriented around rigid mastery of the classical languages with the narrow goal of getting into Harvard or similarly hoity-toity colleges. This new English school, on the other hand, was intended to provide a more practical education to allow middle-class sons to gain access to new commercial opportunities. It would instead teach the new higher branches of learning, including English, literature, science, mathematics, and ancient and American history. Now gradually, during the 1820s and 1830s, this term higher became more generally applied to schools that taught advanced subjects. High school became part of the nomenclature of the common school reformers, and they used it to distinguish public high schools from private academies, which these common school reformers universally loathed. Often, these upper divisions of the schools were on the second floor, and they were literally high. Still, not all of the reformers liked the phrase high school. Horace Mann, the leading light of the common school movement and the state superintendent of education in Massachusetts, lamented the name high school because it sounded too elitist. And this charge that the high school was elitist was a major theme in early education. For a while, high school coexisted with other names like union school. It was challenging even to define a high school. The U.S. Commissioner of Education tried his hand at it, and he tried to say that it had to have two to four years of a defined curriculum, in which case there would have been almost no high schools in America until 1890. Other folks contended that a high school student was any student taking advanced coursework, regardless of the facility, the student's age, the curriculum in place. In rural areas, the high school might meet for as little as 10 weeks a year, compared with 40 weeks in the cities. The high school, in other words, was a very uneven institution early on and much more so than it would be throughout the 20th century. Still, there grew up a few common features to high schools during this period. One of these features was an entrance exam. Now, these typically involved memorizing very abstruse facts like naming the country with a town whose latitude is about 34 degrees south and longitude 19 degrees east, or, say, describing the causes and results of the principal wars with France. Often, the results of these exams were published in the newspapers. Imagine everyone's SAT scores posted on Facebook. 19th century testing also followed the nearly universal law that older generations will complain about what younger generations don't know. As education historian William Rees notes, every village, town, and city after the 1820s periodically complained that the standards were too low or had once been high but had seriously declined. High school is where you saw men remain in the majority of the teaching profession for the longest, clinging on for dear life to retain some higher status in the high school. But by 1880, women became integral to high school instruction across the country, though rarely did they win the title of principal. And there wasn't much advanced about the teaching methods in this high school. Instruction came largely from textbooks. Recitations remained the name of the game when it came to assessment, and prizes were important features in the reward system. What these high schools eventually excelled at was replacing the private academies of various sorts, which had been the earliest innovators in expanding the notion of advanced education in the U.S. By and large, these private academies were not the well-endowed chateaus that pepper New England today, but more like the bootstrap operations run today as charter schools. Education historian William Reese notes that Many private masters were itinerants who were uncommitted to education as a serious pursuit and unable, given the low pay and precarious calling, to assemble a reliable staff. His description of 19th century private schools sounds an awful lot like many of the mediocre charter schools you'll find across the U.S. today. Eventually, some of these private academies would be folded into the public education system as high schools themselves, a move particularly common in parts of the South. Mostly, the people who went to these high schools were those from the middle class or better. 
Northern officials considered about 5% of all students as high school students during the 1860s to 1880, a figure that was much lower in the South, probably around 2 to 3%. As you might suspect from these small percentages, the high school was not always a popular institution in the 19th century. Elitism was usually the biggest complaint about the high school, and those doing the complaining generally fit into one of these categories. The very rich, the very poor, private and religious school supporters, rural people, southerners, and Democrats. Some members of these groups, which often overlapped, argued that high schools weren't serving social mobility at all. They were simply a way for the rich folks to make everyone else pay for their kids' education. Others contended that high schools removed advanced curriculum from the common schools, or that high schools were a misplaced priority. They noted these monstrous new palaces built as high schools in urban areas, while out in the sticks, the common school children shivered without adequate facilities. In communities across the country, locals sometimes decided to close high schools even after they had opened them. Richard White, a public school critic writing in the widely circulated North American Review in 1880, claimed that, according to independent and competent evidence from all quarter, the mass of the public of these public schools are unable to read intelligently, to spell correctly, to write legibly, to describe understandingly the geography of their own country, or to do anything that reasonably well-educated children should do with ease. In the Midwest, educators heard the complaint, you have no right to put your hands into our pockets and extort money to pay for the education of rich men's boys and girls. After the Depression of 1873, the Indiana School Journal worried that unless the high school increase in number and efficiency, this vague feeling will crystallize into definite thought, ending perhaps in the total abolition of the high school. So what shored up the high school? How did it go from being an uneven add-on that smelled of elitism to being the cornerstone of the American public school system, the People's College? We'll take up the standardization process in the next video.